uh, welcome to this uh, uh, meeting of the Tortoise uh, Digital Book Club. A very special uh, gathering. Uh, delighted to have you all here. My name is Matt Danko and I'm an editor and partner at Tortoise. And I'm thrilled that we've got Helen Lewis uh, with us this evening to discuss her book, uh, Difficult Women. Now I have a, uh, a sort of early version, an uncorrected uh, uh, bound proofs, but you'll see behind Helen uh, a sort of artful display of the book. Uh, there it is, um, and, and a beautiful cover design it is too. We were talking about it just before uh, joining you live. Um, I'm thrilled that Helen is here because the book is superb and incredibly thought provoking um, and could not be more contemporary, but also is rich with historical insights. And I, I learned a huge amount um, and I it made me think a lot, but it also uh, typically of Helen who's a amazingly intellectual and witty writer uh, made me laugh a lot too there was some, there's some you know fantastic humor in it um helen if you are uh, as i'm sure most of you know is um a star writer at the atlantic an absolute must read she's also been known for years for her writing at the new statesman and i think you know it's invidious to pick out any of her specific achievements but i think um if you're looking for something to a masterclass in interviewing. Um, check out the the uh, interview she did with Jordan Peterson for GQ, uh, which I think is on YouTube, and um, it really is a spectacular example of the genre, uh, which I'd point any anyone with an interest in journalism and the issues they deal with uh, to look at. But the uh, we're going to talk about the book. Before then, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I'm sure you're all now uh, ex more conversant with Zoom than you probably ever thought you, you would be or wanted to be. But in case you're not, um, the, 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 the best way to go about this, if you look at the participants button, click on that, uh, you'll see that there's a, the opportunity to raise your hand. And this is useful uh, to me because it lets me know that you want to, to speak. And really the objective of tonight is that as many of you get the chance to talk to Helen about the book. I'll, I'll kick off with some, some preliminary questions, but uh, the, the real purpose of this is that you get to interact with her and talk about this, this fantastic book she's written. Um, there's also a chat, and again, if there's points you want to make and raise, um, my, my colleague, the, the, the very brilliant uh, Liz Mosley, uh, another editor partner, is um, uh, monitoring that tonight. There she is. Um, and uh, she will be uh, keeping an eye on policing and, and enjoying your comments and do, do chip in there. If you want to um, say something, you know, that's another way to, to get into the conversation. But um, there's no shortage of, of subjects to, to deal with. Um, so I'm going to jump straight into it, if I may, Helen, and say, you know, which is to say um, what, you know, you, what, what actually drove you to write this book in the way that you did? Because it's a it's history of feminism, but it's a history of feminism done in a very specific way. Yeah, and I have to say, I thought when I was doing it, is this a terrible idea? Is there a reason that nobody has uh, done a history of feminism like this before? Possibly a very good one. So as you say, it's divided into 11 fights, and that allows me to go from the 1830s right up to the present day. So the fight for child custody and divorce law reform right up to going to Ireland and Northern Ireland to talk about abortion law reform. And the reason I wanted to do it was two ways. First of all, because um, I don't know if you've read any feminist articles, Matt, but there is a re recurrent strain of, uh, you know, um, criticism that comes up about, you know, there are four billion women in the world. How can you possibly represent all of them? And so I thought, let's be upfront about that at the start. I can't. I'm not writing a comprehensive history of feminism. I'm not even writing a comprehensive history of British feminism, which is where most of my articles come from, um, most of my interviewees came from. But uh, what I want to do is look at feminism as a movement. Um, and particularly because I started writing this in 2017, I think what was quite a low point for a lot of people in politics, particularly on the liberal left, feeling that the way that the EU referendum had played out was very depressing. The election of Donald Trump was very depressing and not just as defeats for the left, but also as you know, examples of a style of politics that was quite unpleasant. Um, and that, so that what I really want to do is go, well, look, hang on a minute, if you want to talk about a successful political movement, let's look at feminism. 150 years ago, you know, women couldn't attend universities, they couldn't own property, you know, it took, uh, you know, just over 100 years ago, they couldn't vote, you know, they weren't entitled to equal pay until 50 years ago. And all of these milestones have been racked up by a movement that you would think from the outside, people always talk about how it's, you know, rife with civil war and infighting. Well, it's, it was 
and yet it was also enormously successful. So perhaps those two things actually do somehow go together rather than being opposed to one another. And perhaps disagreement and you know nastiness sometimes and and and, and that kind of stuff is is an engine. Um, and also because I really wanted to get away from this idea of kind of boring canonization of people in the past and this you know the word that you constantly heard across the internet in those couple of years was the idea that people were problematic you know and you wanted to scream everything is problematic everyone is problematic you are going to search in vain for somebody who called absolutely everything right throughout history and actually it's more instructive sometimes to find out why people called things wrong so I talk about in the book about the eugenics movement in the 1920s Marriage and it's really interesting to see that as a you know as an outcrop of the first world war and the, and the big move forward in gender relations that that brought but then fears about population decline. So um, I mean what, one of the many sort of things about it that I mean in, in some cases left me, me reeling I, my own ignorance um, things like uh, I had no idea that uh, single women weren't allowed to get the pill until 1974. I mean, this is mind blowing, um, which I think is, I'm right in saying was 13 years after married women. Mm -hmm. um, when you were, um, I, I mean, when you were researching it, what, did, you, did you find out things that, um, that, that, you know, caused you to sort of draw breath and, and think, my God, no. Yeah, and all, and all the time. And I wanted that sense to remain in the book, right? Because I think the way that, Feminism is such a big subject. The way it gets discussed can often be quite alienated to people, right? That they feel if they don't know all the right language or they don't have all the right his history or they haven't read all the right books, then someone's going to shout at them and say, well, you know, what, you, you've such a Johnny, well, Jilly come lately. You know, why have you just turned out? Where were you when we were doing this, that and the other? And of course, you know, you know, I was raised Catholic, so I heard quite a lot about the joy in one sinner who repents, you know, the idea that if you turn up late, that's, you know, at least you've turned up. Yeah. And there was a book that I read that particularly stuck with me. It was, um, it was a, a, a like it's called women's rights a practical guide from 74 i think and they actually had to do a whole updated edition in 76 because so much had changed but that was full of just jaw droppers and quite a lot of them are in the first chapter which is all about legal equality and just stuff like the fact there was a special visa in the 70s for au pair girls so if you were a rich family and you needed to bring over an au pair girl you could have a special immigration visa not there was no reference to au pair boys why would one bring over a young man that was a strange idea um you know the idea that yeah women couldn't get their own higher purchase agreements uh, their own mortgages you know and the one that always blows my mind because it's within my own lifetime is rape in marriage wasn't criminalized until a, a court case in 1991 so you know after the hubble telescope was launched at a time when you know people were listening to new kids on the block that was it was you know it was still assumed that by marrying someone you had consented to all sex with them forever um and that stuff to me is it's is just completely astonishing and then of course in the writing of the book the changes came in both ireland's abortion laws and then northern ireland's at the beginning um of the year so you know it, i went through this very odd period between filing the book and, and waiting through the drafts where i was kind of like okay could feminism just just pause just pause <laughs> But you've done a great job, lads, but come on, let's just, let's just keep it down for a bit. But it was a joy. You know, I wrote a postscript that won't be in your copy about exactly what happened in Northern Ireland, because those women that I talk about, the three older women who all bought morning after pills on the internet and then handed themselves into Derry police station, you know, they went and had a celebration in the council offices because they said, you know, we're not renegades anymore. We're, you know, we're not, we're not outlaws. And that it, was wonderful. It, 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 that, that chapter I thought was, um, very moving the, the the chapter on abortion and and um it, it struck me that what it brought home was that progress is not linear and in fact the the the, the, the rights that previous generations have won need to be very jealously invigilated otherwise they can be withdrawn and i, I it made me wonder what you know since you're writing the book what your thoughts are about what's going on in america and elsewhere on that front, whether it, you know, very serious and, and clearly orchestrated attempts to chip away at Roe v. Wade and, 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 and make it almost impossible. Yeah, I think that's, that is something that's really alarming. And America is, is one of the best examples of that. You know, the fact that as soon as coronavirus happened, there were southern states that said, well, you know, abortion is a non-essential medical procedure. Let's stop all of them immediately. Um, and, you know, 
the thing that's the really sad thing about that is that happened exactly the same time that you know maternity care was 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 also being taken away people were told they weren't allowed to have anybody with them when they were in in labor now u.s maternal mortality rates are already terrible for a developed world country and black women die at twice the rate of white ones there are some really serious problems going on with the u.s healthcare system there and so both at the beginning and end of pregnancies women were being sidelined and told that these weren't real issues and 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 having spent so much time in feminism being told that you know you're all middle-class women kind of complaining about armpit hair. It's so astonishing to me to see that there are literal life and death issues that also get treated with the same casual disregard. But yeah, as you say, part of the, to me, the, or the other thing I put in the book was about the idea that history is a process. Writing history is a process. It has to be continually renewed and refreshed. And for me, writing a history is itself a political project, you know. Um, Marxist feminists in the 1970s had this idea of hidden from history. The idea that, you know, the dominant mode of history excluded women. And I think I felt that almost every day when I was writing this, I thought I should, I should know this. You know, the suffragette story is so interesting and so much more complicated than I learned at school. And is actually, I think, a more interesting story for its complexity. Yeah, I, I, you make a, it's a constant theme in the book, which I really uh, felt a lot of uh, affinity for, which, which, which was that it's very complicated and that, uh, you you kind of you you shun the argument that the debate is over and you you kind of welcome nuance and you make the point that that all these things have been hard won and often won by stages and that it's an error to think of progress as a kind of linear uh, phenomenon um, i just wondered if there were any particular examples that struck you about that well the compromise point i do always think about because two massive examples within the scope of the book. The first is the idea that, you know, this, the, I had always wondered why it was that the suffragettes accepted the compromise in 1918 of only women over 30 who were property owners um, would get the vote. And that's often presented as, oh, look, these middle-class ladies threw everyone else under the bus. Once they got the vote, you know, they were happy. And then you read this extraordinary fact about the fact that there were so many men who died in the First World War that had there been truly universal female suffrage after it, women would have instantly gone from no part of the electorate to a majority of it. And you think, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm sort of surprised that they got anything <laughs> at all. Um, and, and, and what happened was there was a speaker's convention, the Speaker of the House of Commons called in a whole load of people while the First World War was still going on, including Millicent Fawcett, who was the leader of nonviolent suffragists, uh, Emmeline Pankhurst of the suffragettes. And they both agreed to this compromise because they thought once we've established the principle that women aren't going to go completely do lally with when they vote, I don't know what they thought they were going to do with it, um, that, you know, it'd be easier to get full universal suffrage, which then came 10 years later. And the other, uh, you know, one to me is, is an obvious one. Well, actually, you might mention the pill going to married women first um, and actually contraceptive rights then followed, being followed by abortion rights once you've established the principle of bodily autonomy being important for women and being something they have a right to. But then civil partnerships leading to full gay marriage and you get civil partnerships to get over the objections of the established churches. And then it turns out sort of five to six years later that everyone's kind of gone, oh, oh, yeah, well, actually, yeah, we're not that, you know, we're not that bothered by this. And you have a conservative prime minister saying, you know, I believe in gay marriage because I'm a conservative. I'm a conservative. And in all of those cases, the people were entirely right to take the compromise. And yet it's such a dirty word in politics. It's interesting. Um, I thought again and again, as I was reading the book and, and looking at it again in the last few days, um, of that wonderful quote from E.P. Thompson about the, the condescensions of posterity. And I think one of the things that you do is you, re you retrieve people from those condescensions. And um, I'd love you to tell, if you, if, you, if, if you would, the story of Maureen Colquhoun, oh. who was someone I, I, I will put my hands up and say I was not aware of, and, and what a story. I was exactly the same. I hadn't heard of, of Maureen Colquhoun. And actually that whole chapter happened in an oddly roundabout way, um, where I was already studying another um, lesbian actress of the 1970s called uh, Jackie Forster. Uh, who came out on Speaker's Corner. She was a, a, a TV presenter and she came out on Speaker's Corner in 1969 saying, I'm, you were looking at a roaring lesbian, <laughs> which, was, uh, which is a great sentence in any decade, but for 1969 was particularly impressive. And I, you know, I knew she'd been going out with this woman called Babs Todd. And then I found an article by Matthew Paris in the Times that said about you know, the idea that parties often don't you know, treat their trailblazers particularly well. And it also talked about the idea about the fact that he felt that the modern LGBT movement was too sensitive. 
um, and, and, and in the course of, you know, his lifetime as an out gay man had moved, you know, in this, in this particular direction. And it mentioned, you know, Maureen Cahoon and said, you know, she's now 91, I think well, she would have been at the time, uh, you know, in her lifetime, she remembers a time when you couldn't be gay, you know, will there soon be a time when you can't laugh at, at gay people for their excesses? And I thought, Maureen Cahoon, who's she? I went to, uh, I think probably Wikipedia or something like that. <laughs> and it said, Maureen Cahoon partner, Babs Todd. And I was like, oh, I mean, you know, fair enough that the, the lesbian London was probably quite a small scene in the 70s. But then I, it was this great moment where all these pieces of this jigsaw came together. And I was so surprised like you, because I thought the first gay MP was Chris Smith of the new Labour yeah, government. Yeah. He's the first person to come out voluntarily in office. What happened was Maureen got elected. She was still married in 1973, uh, worked on a bill called the Balance of the Sexes Act, which was an extraordinary piece of legislation that basically said, you know, we'll see your... Uh, you know, <laughs> we'll see your even then discrimination act in 1975 and like raise you this, where I want <laughs> half of the House of Lords to be female, half of every government body to be female. Um, and, you know, in the course of doing that, she met and fell in love with Babs Todd. They both left their respective partners, set up home together, got outed by the Daily Mail um, in a way. And they also taught me something that I didn't know before. So they had a, a, a home housewarming, which had a picture of two women kissing on it. This found its way to Nigel Dempster at the mail. And he sort of effectively blackmailed someone who was at that housewarming, who was a lesbian, who wanted to go and work in America, saying, if I out you, you'll be classed as somebody with you know, a deviant personality and you won't get your visa. And I thought, I had absolutely no idea that as late as that, you would, you know, it would be a, a visa issue. And that's something that came up again in the abortion chapter. The idea that, you know, these women who were older decided that they would take um, the, you know, the abortion pills and hand themselves into the station. Because if you get convicted before then, you know, abortion is an offense, is under the Offences Against the Person Act. It's essentially an yeah. assault conviction. You've essentially assaulted the fetus. That's the idea behind it. And there are certain exceptions in British law. And if you pick up an assault conviction, it goes again on your disclosure and barring films, uh, films if you want to work with children or vulnerable adults. And it goes on your visa forms if you want to work in places like Australia and America. So they said, we can't make, you know, a young woman make that sacrifice that she might never be able to go to America again. But, you know, it's, it, we're OK with that. And just looking at the ways that the systems regulate women's behavior in ways that I wouldn't even have ever thought about was extraordinary. But it was even more extraordinary to me that Labour is not championing more in Cahoon. You know, where is, you know, in a, in a party which has its, you know, has form for misty eyed looking back to the 70s, yes. Maureen Cahoon is mysteriously absent. That's right, where's the plaque, where's the statue? Um, yeah. I, I'm keen to get some um, uh, inter interventions and contributions in from, from other people, but just um, before I do, I, I wanted to ask a question about the different waves of feminism. And you, you talk about um, the coming fifth wave uh, and, and how it should emphasize structures. Could you unpack that a little? Because um, obviously not everyone will know what the different waves are. And um, can you explain what the fifth wave is and what it should be doing? Yeah, I'm not sure. I, mean, I think I was sort of trying to create, I was trying to make the fifth wave happen, like yeah. making fetch happen. <laughs> but um, I think the coronavirus has probably put a, a, a lid on that one for a while. But yes. the first wave is generally agreed to be from kind of Mary Wollstonecraft, Vindication of the Rights of Women in 1792, through to the suffragettes in, about nine, in the 1910s. You know, the first we, women's sort of legal right to the vote, that kind of ends with. The second wave revives in the 70s, um, and it's things like the Sex Discrimination Act, equal pay, um, founding of rape shelters. I mean, this is what, you know, I'm, I'm always astonished that modern feminists can be a bit dismissive about the second wave, because if you look at what it got done in a period of, of under 10 years, it is absolutely extraordinary in terms of things like, you know, just not being able to get served at a bar if you're a woman, like all of that swept away in, in that 10 year period. The third wave then comes in the 1990s and is often about sexual harassment. So the big thing in the US is the Anita Hill case where she accused Justin, um, putative Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas of sexual harassment at the law firm they worked together. There was a big hearing about it. He said it was a high tech lynching for uppity blacks. Anita Hill was also black. And it devolved into this huge you know, question about who, who do we believe? You know, what does a woman have to do to be, to be believed? Which all came back out when the, the Brett Kavanaugh confirmation hearings were, were happening a couple of years ago. And then, you know, the fourth wave is really associated with social media and online spaces. So things like UK Feminista, um, uh, Everyday Sexism, Catelyn Moran's book, How to Be a Woman in 2011, was extremely popular. I think it was a lot of people's first entry to it. Um, and, you know, and I think that wave has also got a, a good deal of stuff done. 
it's been harder, I think, as legal structures have, you know, not been the focus of, of campaigning to some extent, because everything else is sort of slightly impressionistic and subjective, and also doesn't necessarily apply to absolutely everybody. So the question of priorities is a lot tougher. So what I suggested was, you know, there is still quite a lot of bad law that affects women and also a lot of bad policy making which disproportionately affects women. Something like universal credit being an obvious example, switching to that, you know, it was, it was warned, Ian Duncan Smith was warned in the early stages of setting that up that it was a bad idea to have household payments. So you get paid as a household instead of individually like job seekers allowance, because, you know, who gets to be head of the household? Well, it's often the bloke. And in the 1970s, you've got Barbara Castle saying, you know, I want child benefit to go in the purse not in the wallet everybody said oh, well, much easier you know men already get pay packets we'll give it to them and she was like well what happens if a woman gets left alone with the kids she has to then be a sort of supplicant asking for this this money go give it straight to the primary caregiver and all of that got swept away by universal credit and that should be undone you know the five-week wait is really tough for, for people the sanctions regime is really tough for people and all of that stuff in policy making terms you know there have particular effects on women could be, um, is Suzanne Moore there? Paging Suzanne Moore, uh, who I see <laughs> uh, intervening on the chat. Are you uh, there, Suzanne? No, hang on, I'll just say. Where are you? I, I'm gonna just say. Switch your video on, Suzanne. Come on, Suzanne. Okay, man, it's Suzanne's daughter, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Great, Suzanne, this is a great scene in one moment. I'm not going on. <laughs> I mean, if you want, I can answer her. I can, having I'll, scoped I'll, on her question. I'll, 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 I'll come back to you. Um, uh, can we, can, we'll come back to you, Suzanne, while, whilst you're uh, sorting out the keyboard. Um, uh, can we go to Barbara? Barbara, I think you had a, a question. Um, yes, hi. I'll just see hi. if I can get my video <laughs> Um, I'm really just curious about how, where, I like your uh, waves, I'm always suspicious about waves as well. Um, I'm just wondering which wave you would fit uh, intersectional feminism into. Um, uh, I really ask this on behalf of my daughter, who's not here today, but she's um, you know, done a lot of work in this area. And I'd be really curious to see what her reaction would be to what you're saying. But, um, so I'm just sort of throwing that into the mix to see how your, what your response to that would be. Yeah, I mean, I think um, intersectional, intersectionality was a, a word that really became very popular in about 2013. Um, but it dates much back, further back than that. I think Kimberly Crenshaw's original work uh, is from the 1990s. So it's something that people were talking about. And it's one of those things where it's such an important concept. And the way that um, Kimberly um, Crenshaw is a legal scholar. So she frames it like this, you know, that sometimes you can't talk about only there only being one you know oppression in someone's life sometimes their oppressions meet at an intersection and it doesn't mean this one plus this one it means that those ones in like they influence each other and they are unentangleable from each other so if you look at the way for example that you know serena williams's musculature is mocked that's not just about her being black or being a woman it's about having a black woman it's misogynoir or for example the one that kimberly crenshaw uses is you know if you're running um a women's shelter in, in america in a predominantly hispanic area and you don't have any staff who speak spanish you're excluding a huge part of your community. Your women are being oppressed both by virtue of being women and also by virtue of not being non-English speakers. And that, you know, that is a really important insight. I was the chair of a women's charity for a while. And we dealt with things like this growing, you know, the hostile environment. For example, immigration officers would say, you know, could you get women, you know, to testify against partners who, you know, we'd like to deport? And you kind of go, that's not, you know, that's not, we can't get involved in political decisions like that but we also had the situation where there were women with no recourse to public funds you know some people only get uh, admits to the country on that that ground so what happens to them when they get beaten up by their husbands um you know or coercive control we already know that there is a form of domestic violence where the uh, the controlling person will take away access to someone's funds well that can also happen with immigration right that can also happen by you confiscate someone's passport and then they overstay their visa and you won't let them renew it so they're in the country illegally so you say if you leave me or you know if you push them into sex work and they, they want to escape that you say then are you know then you'll get deported and that's why it's really important to have those intersectional insights because that's not just a problem of being a woman it's a woman intersecting with something else um the trouble with it was is i think it 
the way it got ended up being used was it was being used as an I am an intersectional feminist and some feminists who are bad are non-intersectional feminists I think there's some random wikipedia page where it says I'm a non-intersectional feminist and I thought well what does that what does that mean and what it was sort of used to do was it was used as a kind of badge to say I'm one of the good ones and and that's largely been superseded in by um by the trans question in who is a good feminist and who is a bad feminist. Um, but it was, it, you know, it, it made me quite sad that it, it became fodder for a, a million internet debates because the fundamental insight from Kimberly Crenshaw is a really important one. Uh, thanks, Helen. I, I think we've got a, um, a question from Nicholas Stanhope, who's a, uh, a, a regular and much, uh, much, much, much loved uh, thinking participant. Hi, Nicholas. Yeah, um, I, I was slightly surprised because my interjection in the in the chat was way back. Um, but I was interested in what you said Helen, about um, accessibility to contraception uh, as as a young person in the 70s. Um, and I did just interject that when I went up to Oxford in 1971, I went straight on the pill, making no moral judgments. And we were still in... Uh, <laughs> We were still in single sex colleges, which had gate hours as well. So it was a massive challenge. And so I just wondered when, when you said about um, when accessibility for single women to have accessibility to contraception, where that came from. Oh, uh, in, in legal terms, I think, it, I mean, it was the prescription, it was the NHS prescription guidance. I think there may have been some, some rogue... <laughs> Doctors who were a bit more friendly can give you under the cap, you know. I, I think, which I think is fascinating. But I'd, I'd love, you know, you must email me about your experience because I think that the early, you know, it took a long time for women to break into education. I write in the book about, you know, Sophia Jex Blake and the Edinburgh Seven in 1870. But yeah, you know, I can't I think it was Cambridge didn't give degrees to women until about what was it, 1949 or something? It was, it was, it was, yeah, it was 48. And yeah. I think Oxford, even later than that. Yeah. No, I'm happy happy to talk about it. I mean, I never felt in 1971 like I was a groundbreaker. I mean, I felt quite um I felt quite privileged to be going to, you know, a fantastic university to study uh, in a college which was all women, but in a university which was um, predominantly men, um, which had a whole range of really positive aspects to it. So I was one of 200 law uh, students that year um, and there were 20 of us. So, you know, the odds were pretty good. Um, but what it did do was to make one think about what the opportunities were when you came out. And I think one of the things that I really enjoyed about the Ruth Bader Ginsburg um, documentary was the choices she made, which was, you know, a decade or two earlier than me, but, but about how you as a woman lawyer choose to make a career and what he did was to go into academia and became very distinguished and then obviously from then on moved into into practice um so anyway that, that's this is digression and me and the pill but anyway moving no on. it was a good digression <laughs> and actually the interesting thing is that that is also the, the route that you talk about ruth bader ginsburg taking not you know um the classic advocate route but the academia route, is also the same one taken by brenda hale so that yes, she could um man she could have a career and have children and actually I think, you, you know, anybody would, <laughs> there were some memoirs that came out from one of her fem, former uh, colleagues on the Supreme Court that said, you know, Brenda's always pushing her feminist agenda. Blah, blah, and there was a huge deal of resistance to her and this idea that she was, you know, somehow being overly influenced by, um, you know, having a second X chromosome. But it was, it was very notable that she had to carve out, there was a particular route you get to the top of law and it was one that, oh, how strange is just one that's harder for women to get on. But that's just meritocracy. That's just how it happens, guys. Yeah. And it turned that's out, you know, Academia has produced two of the finest female jurists of the, you know, the 21st century. Thank you. And uh, I think Sally Young had a question. If we can um, come to Sally. Sally, are Hi. you there? Hi, Sally. Hi, hello. Hello from Newcastle and with a very unimpressive bookshelf behind me. Um, I, I'm also the woman who at 18 had to get a, 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 a so-called engagement winner for Woolworths to go to our what was then called, it wouldn't be called a family planning clinic in those days, I think, um, to try and avoid a family, obviously. The issue for me is about the whole thing about difficulty. Are we really any more difficult than the so-called different men? Is it just because we don't conform to society's expectations? Um, and also about the issue of class, which, I mean, you, you do talk about working class women in the book as well, but I think that's something that you haven't really covered yet. And obviously mm -hmm. um, there are advantages to, to many of us for all sorts of different reasons. 
But I think it's about that not conforming to the expectations. And are we really more difficult or is it just because it's more unusual that we're women? On the class point, I agree. I think that is a really interesting and fruitful because it's not just about, you know, the different levels of disadvantage you suffer if you're poorer than someone else. It's also about the way that you get kind of read as respectable. And the idea of not being respectable is something that has been used to dismiss women um, hugely. And it was really noticeable to me when uh, Annie Kenny and uh, Christopher Pankhurst get arrested in 1905 for disrupting the meeting with um, Winston Churchill and Edward Grey at it with, you know, with their votes for women banner. The Guardian report of the time says, you know, the magistrate has got them saying, you know, we thought they could have, you know, they behaved, they were spitting in the street and, you know, they, they the kind of thing you'd expect to see from washerwomen. Um, and that was, you know, versus Constance Lytton as an aristocrat saying, you know, I've been bred to being kind of incredibly passive and, you know, something about, you know, not, you know, being so used to the bridal, I didn't even notice it. And there was definitely, and I think still is, a kind of invocation of working class women being unruly and unmanageable and vulgar. And you mustn't be like that. And that's actually used to regulate middle class women's behavior because actually what does being ladylike mean? It means being kind of quiet and compliant. And there are definitely, as well as gender, there are class-based overtones to that. Um, but in terms of difficult men, yeah, I think there are loads of difficult men. I think that we call them things like, you know, genius, for example. Um, I, this, I'm, I'm working on my second book, I don't know why, but, um, and one of the things I want to write a little bit about is this idea about who gets to be, uh, you know, the kind of star that gets supported by everybody around them. And, and it's, you know, the, the film director who is just a monster that everybody sacrifices everything for because, you know, he's a genius. So therefore he's allowed to throw tea trays at assistants. And actually the way that in sometimes in men, that level of difficulty is read as, as being a sign of brilliance or of higher, you know, higher artistic or creative or intellectual powers. And you don't tend to get that level of latitude if, if you're a woman. Thank you, Helen. I think uh, Megan Kenyon had a question. Megan, hi. Hi, uh, I, I actually finished your book yesterday and I loved it. It's really brilliant. Um, I just had a question about uh, just the role of social media. Um, because you mentioned, I think it was in the chapter about time, um, about how social media has kind of allowed more people to get involved in the sort of wider feminist movement. Um, but alternatively, it's also sort of held the movement as a whole up for more criticism, and especially on sort of, a, sort of an individual and personal level, um, obviously over Twitter and things like that. And I just wondered how maybe feminism's relationship with social media should change for in in the future in order to you know make i don't know bring the move a bit better than it is at the moment because i feel like social media has kind of made it um made a lot of infighting and, and things like that when really we should be sort of united against the patriarchy if you will so yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with you. I, uh, as you may be able to tell by the book, I am um, uh, <laughs> in a sort of unpleasant relationship with Twitter where I try and leave it and then I kind of come crawling back desperate for attention. Um, it just doesn't really reflect very well on me. But I think the thing that was really obvious to me, and I wrote a piece, which again, as ever, I got quite a lot of grief on Twitter for a couple of years ago about a women's place, which is an organization for gender critical feminist campaigning against reforms to the Equalities Act. And whatever you think about their campaign, it was really noticeable to me when I went and reported on one of those meetings that these were people who had what we call strong bonds. You know, they knew each other in real life. They spoke like a lot of, all the time. They had formed a network that was quite resilient and quite resistant to outside pressure. And, you know, at that point they were getting their meetings protested by people and, uh, you know, and that kind of stuff. And it reminded me a lot of, there's an essay by Malcolm Gladwell called The Revolution Will Not Be Tweeted, which he wrote around the time of the Arab Spring uprisings and got a lot of grief for it because everyone was in this mode of like, no, you know, the internet will set us free. You know, Iran is going to change utterly. And actually pretty much if you read that essay now, he's been vindicated because he talks about the fact that social media forms weak bonds. So, you know, someone you know only through Twitter, you might have a kind of casual agreement with, but actually really in a kind of trench are you going to be, you know, fully on their side? And he talks about the civil rights movement in America. If you're going to go to a lunch counter and get spat on and some stuff thrown at you, you're going to go to the bridge at Selma and get beaten up. You need to really know that you're all on the same side and that you've kind of all got each other's backs. And that, to me, was the really sad thing about seeing what happened on Twitter is I think, I mean, Suzanne has said this multiple times. It's brilliant for the consciousness raising bit. You know, something like everyday sexism, I think particularly for a lot of men, they just read this stuff and they were like, I had no idea. And why would you have any idea about this extent of street harassment if it never happens to you or never happens when you're around? Like, you're not psychic. 
So it was absolutely brilliant for that stuff. But in terms of actually formulating a strategy and enacting it, really, really hard because who's in charge? And actually it would collapse at any point anybody tried to be in charge. And there's a Joe Freeman essay called The Tyranny of Structurelessness, which talks exactly about this. But fundamentally, if you want to get something done, someone's going to actually have to do some legwork on it. And some people are going to have to pitch in. And social media is kind of totally anathemous to that. And, and you know, we went through a wave where everybody was sending emails to their MPs about this, that and the other. And they were just going straight to filter to junk. And actually worse than that, I think, was the idea that people, it was a sort of synthetic activism where people felt like they were doing a huge amount. Like, I've been tweeting about sexism for days now. Why isn't it solved? And, you know, well, actually, you know, Caroline Crowder Perez says all the time, you know, an event we did, she said, I could, I could have a, a petition that says end patriarchy and I'd get thousands of signatures. But what, what, do I, what does that mean? How is that, what, what manifestations of that happen in the real world? And so the most successful feminist campaigns I've seen in the last couple of years have been ones that have been incredibly tightly focused on a economic or legal change. So uh, FGM prosecutions, for example, you know, about training police forces to be able to recognize the signs, you know, dealing with the uncomfortable racial conversations that that involves as well. Um, you know, an education campaign for girls in the communities most affected um, and ensuring you know, when a prosecution goes through that people complainants are properly supported through the process. And all of that was quite boring work right? It wasn't glamorous. Uh, you know, no one was particularly interested in it, um, but it needed to be done in order for that practice to be, you know, cracked down on. And that's, you know, I, I think there's a lot of hobbyist politics on, on Twitter and a lot of people positioning themselves as correct, but actually what gets done on there, it's harder to see that. Just following on from that, Helen, um, do you think that the big fracture over the trans issue uh, would have been quite as bitter as it has been without social media? Or is there actually, in all of this, a, such a fundamental question, a series of fundamental questions about what a woman is, uh, what a safe space is, that it, there was going to be some sort of um, at least reckoning uh, at some point, as there now has been? I think that issue would always have um, come up because it is really a question of liberalism and individualism, uh, which is a very dominant strain in politics now, right? Who has the right to tell you what you are? Uh, and to what extent is, is your identity socially created? It's about the thing that people put on you versus how much is it about how you feel inside? And the kind of Marxist feminist tradition had, you know, an analysis of gender that with gender was an oppressive system imposed on women. And that has kind of yielded to a more modern conception of gender, which is about gender as performativity. Right? This is Judith Butler's idea, you know, that you perform gender constantly. And those two things are, are intention. You know, I think they probably are both true to some extent, but they were always going to, there was always going to be a collision with them. Um, and I think, I think that Twitter, I don't think I'm in Twitter, I name the political debate that Twitter has improved. Um, <laughs> but I think that the difficulty to me was that with that issue, that a sensible position that everybody could have agreed with, right? That there are people who desperately want to live as the opposite sex than when they were born in. They should be allowed to do so without discrimination or oppression. They should be properly supported and medically funded to, you know, to do so. I think pretty much everybody could have got involved in that. But honestly, I think there were organizations like Stonewall, which having one gay marriage thought that this was the next civil rights issue. And in order to prosecute that case, they needed, they needed it to be a wedge. They needed not everybody to be in favor of it. So we moved from a position then where we had the um, Women and Equalities Committee uh, inquiry, which was basically Maria Miller's attempt to salvage her reputation after being done for expenses fraud, to reinvent herself as, a, you know, as, as a top feminist, which didn't hear from any women's organizations when we were talking about, um, about trans rights. So there wasn't really any awareness of how, for example, it, prisons or women's shelters would pre present really difficult cases that needed to be talked through. Scotland has, has tended to deal with this debate quite a lot better, actually. Um, and, and that's because its LGBT organisations have been more open to the idea that sometimes there might be cases where someone who is legally a, a, a woman might still need to be treated as biologically male. Um, but, you know, by pursuing this very doctrinaire position that everybody was exactly what they say they were, you created unavoidable conflicts. And it just took a, a couple of years for that to play out. And it's, I, you know, I think I find it, a level of huge regret that I know that there are lots of trans people who are afraid uh, and feel very worried and feel that they're very, very got at 
by this whole debate and they feel like they feel less safe going about their daily lives because of the way it's played out. And I think that probably didn't need to happen. And there's lots of people to blame for, for that happening. Uh, thank, thank you. Uh, uh, Matilda white Javazia. I hope I've pronounced your name correctly, Matilda. Are you there? Hi, yeah. My Hi, welcome. Emma, I've just realised I'm logged in as my nine-year-old daughter, who is Matilda. <laughs> so apologies for that. Um, my, I, I thought the book was really interesting, actually very moving. I was kind of wrapped with white middle-class privilege reading the whole thing. Um, and I, I had a very feminist education. I did classics with Mary Beard at Newnham College, which is still the women's college in Cambridge. And I did a women's studies postgrad in Oxford. And it wasn't until I got older that I realized the extent to which most people didn't do those things. And these issues are not well known and not well talked about. And I think the idea of using people who we haven't heard of to talk about issues that we do know about works really well. But I was interested in the extent to which partly as per the research with this, but partly sort of your work more broadly, you think there can or should be kind of a more structured, more formalized way of teaching about feminism and about the strains of women's issues, either in the education sector or in society more large, more broadly, because there, there isn't a lot of awareness. And these issues and these people do need to be better known and better talked about. But I, I sort of have an issue with teaching feminism as a constrained subject and I think it's interesting to talk about how we can bring these issues forward in sort of public discourse within the context of the subjects we are looking at more, more widely. Uh, I'd just be interested in what your, what your views are on that. I think it's a really interesting question. I remember um, Deborah Cameron, who you'll remember from the book, when I talked to her about an early draft, saying she, one of the things that she had realised was that there wasn't the, play, you know, when she was an undergraduate at Oxford, I believe in the 70s or 80s, you know, that, that it was quite usual to kind of go and volunteer at a women's shelter or get mm. involved with your trade union, or there were lots of outlets for what you yeah. might call kind of political education. And that's, those have shrunk, you know, the women's sector is now very professionalised and very few, you know, normal everyday citizens going about their daily lives would ever come into contact with anyone who's, who's been in one uh, or, mm. or going one themselves um, because you know they're, they're hidden away and I think that is you know that is a, sh a shame because it's it's all it all seems like someone else's problem then you know I, I pay my taxes so isn't that taken care of for me whereas the 70s had a much more do-it-yourself attitude um, to all of this kind of stuff and also had a, a huge emphasis on on face-to-face -face meetings and like I said about a woman's place, wherever you stand on that particular issue, you know, if I, for anybody who's on the other side of that issue, I would also recommend exactly the same thing to do, have face-to-face -face meetings, build up a group of like-minded people and see them really regularly, because it is, it is the foundation of, of activism. I don't know about schools. Um, my best friend is uh, Laura McInerney, who writes a column for the uh, Guardian and was a former editor of schools, but you know, a former teacher. And she was a citizenship teacher. And, you know, she was very upset to see the way that got marginalized from the curriculum. And I kind of agree with her. You know, we, we have the sort of, uh, I mean, I've, it's been a long time since I've been at school and I don't have children, so I'm no expert on this. But, you know, this, the, the idea of teaching people how to be a person in the world seems to me something really important in, in education and, and critical thinking, media literacy, you know, all of these things that we, that don't fit in with the kind of legacy of the Victorian curriculum that we've inherited. Are, are absolutely key skills for the 21st century. And part of that should be about, you know, about politics and activism. Brilliant, thank you, Helen. Um, can we go to uh, Alice Wright now, who's had her hand up for a little while. Alice, hi, welcome. Hello, um, I just wanted to go back to um, the pill quickly, um, because I think that, um, as you were saying, Matt, it's important not to just see progress as linear and to not be afraid of revisiting things um, and accept. So my question really is, um, should we really be seeing the pill um, as liberation, like liberation in a box? Because I had terrible mental health side effects from the pill and I'm not alone, but um, you are alone when you confront the medical establishment. They will not um, accept that that is the case, um, but many women do find this. Um, there are also male contraceptives that are ready to go to market, but they've been stopped at the last stage because um, the uh, male participants in the trial have reported mental health side effects, so they've been stopped. This was completely disregarded for all contraceptive, um, contraceptive pills that are for women because there is still in the medical canon this idea that women 
are hysterical and emotional and hormonal. So if they experience some more of this, that's okay. So perhaps we should revisit the effects of the pill um, and why there isn't um, options for men as well. I'm going to, first of all, sympathize with you. That sounds like you had a, a terrible experience. And I actually had a similar one. I went on with the pill for the first time at university and I went straight into a, a, a really unpleasant depression and kind of went, well, I'm never taking this again because this was horrible. And exactly the same experience of you saying to a GP, uh, very suddenly after starting to take this pill, I, you know, I just, I felt no joy at all in my life. Um, and, and then kind of going, well, I, and it was a male doctor going, and that, I mean, that doesn't seem very likely. And then doing exactly the same reading as you and going, oh, actually quite a lot of women report um, mental health uh, effects to this. But I'm going to also disagree with you and the pill is liberation and you only have to look at the world before the pill to see that. Um, you know, I write about these women writing to Mary Stopes who had nine children and a uterine prolapse and, and knew that another pregnancy would kill them, but had no method of, of preventing that. You know, it's a very reliable, cheap contraceptive. Uh, it's much easier to use than things like cervical caps and gels. But I do agree with you that it is interesting that there is a lower level of tolerance for side effects in uh, male contraceptives. And actually in the, in the sex chapter of the book, I write also about ideas about bad sex for men and women and this idea of relative deprivation, right? That basically for when, when you do surveys and you talk to men about what bad sex means, they say, basically say, I didn't have an orgasm. And you talk to what women about what bad sex is and they say, it was physically incredibly painful. Uh, and those two levels, what we, what we kind of accept for women, you know, and post, um, Sex after childbirth is another example that women are sort of expected to kind of grit their teeth and get on with it. Well, no, actually, if this big part of your life is now impaired, that is a medical problem. It's not just your little lady feels that you're, you know, you need to kind of suck it up. But I, th I think one of the other things that a male contraceptive would founder on is a level of, of trust. And the, the, the thing that's fascinating to me about the history of contraception is it's a history of empowering women to, to definitely be in charge of their own bodies. And you have to have a lot of trust in a, in a male partner in order to delegate that decision to them. And I think that even if you did get approval for it, there would still be a lot of resistance. But that isn't, you know, there's no reason why, those, why people shouldn't have the option. I entirely agree with you. And I do think there is a definite problem. But we also know, um, if you've read Caroline Criado Perez's book about women's pain being taken less seriously by doctors, for example. Um, and, and, and there is definitely a problem with medical models that rely on a, on a male body and still treat the female body as something kind of that occasionally is a freak of nature rather than 51% of the population. Thanks. Um, my colleague Tessa Murray has a hand up. Tessa, hi. Are you there? Hey, Tessa. Hi, hi. Um, oh, God, Helen, I loved it. I could, I could go on for days. There's so much in there that's just eye-opening and brilliantly expressed and... Um, but I, d I did particularly enjoy the chapter on sex. It really, I thought it was brilliantly done. And it, it and back to this idea of, of pleasure, I, I'm the mother of teenage daughters and pray God they're not on this because they'll kill me. <laughs> but um, one of the things that I get really fed up with over supper, we're an all female household, so our suppers are quite wide ranging, um, is the PSHE teaching about sex, which seems to be sort of, um, really about um, managing this adversarial process that you're about to be exposed to and protecting yourself from it. And, um, and the other night over supper, I was like, well, you know, have you covered, you know, your own desire and recognizing that and masturbation? And the table cleared within about 12 seconds. The hand went up and said, we are never talking about this again, Jean, Jean from Sex Education. I was like, no, but if we don't start with that, you know, where, where, why, why on earth would you have the rest of the conversation? And it's still, you know, it still feels to me that girls at school are being taught how to navigate a, a battlefield. And, that, and, um, and it, really, it really upsets me. I, you know, I mean, apart from the, the oppressive amount of, you know, the threat of, the constant threat of sexual violence that my girls have to get out in, to in the world just to, to navigate the world every day, then in their own personal space, this is still some sort of, uh, as I say, a sort of adversarial thing. And, and that feels all wrong to me. Yeah, I know. I agree with you about that. And I think it's, you know, I'm not, I'm not very, I don't have a lot of truck with the men's rights activist argument that, you know, feminism is always about making out women to be victims because you kind of go, well, look, I'm sorry, if we're going to look at domestic homicides, then it's that, you know, they're just, it's not, they're making the victims. That's reflecting uh, reality. But I think in the case of, um, sex we have fallen into this idea that um there's this great quote by martin crane in fraser he says sex is between you and the person you're doing it to 
And there is that kind of assumption that it is, it's something that men do to women. Uh, and, you know, they have to either decide, you know, whether or not now, you know, they're, they're going to get enough of a trade up off it um, for it to be kind of worth their reputation rather than it being something that quite a lot of women, it turns out, actually quite enjoy. Um, and I think we're very reluctant about that. And I, and I partly do also, as well as schools lay that at the feet of the porn industry, which is a huge, you know, an almost unexplored, uncriticized, uninterrogated factor of a huge number of men's sex lives that we just don't talk about. I put in the book, you know. I find it extraordinary that we're in this world in which, you know, if I use the wrong word on Twitter, you know, everybody in the world descends on me. You still have porn sites where interracial is a separate category. Like that's a weird fetish that people have rather than a million people in Britain live in mixed race relationships. This is not an odd thing at all, but because it's porn, like all bets are off. No, no politics apply in, this, in the sphere. Um, and I think that's a real problem. And it's yeah. also, you'll notice one that it's very hard to talk about because you get told that you're prudish. Whereas actually what we're talking about is a lot of men consuming, uh, you know, a form of sexuality in which women don't really often appear to be having a particularly good time or are having a performatively good time, but not a, a genuine one. And it's not filmed from their point of view, right? It's not, you know, focused on them. Uh, and, and it's one of those things that's really fascinating when you can tell when you're doing some real feminism by how much people get kind of instantly, you know, want to debunk you and want to, and want to stop you speaking rather than doing kind of approved feminism where you just sort of mouth the right things about the, the subject of the day and nothing really changes. I'm having a happy flashback to Sunday lunch with my dad where I told him it wasn't penetration, it was enclosure. Oh, that's such a great 70s feminist um, <laughs> thing. Yeah, it's taking me right <laughs> back. Shush them. I think Andrew Dworkin has something on that too, in a similar vein. Um, Helen, can I, can I ask a question? We're, we're, uh, sadly, comes towards the, the end, but I, I, did, I did want to sort of ask you for a kind of progress report on Me Too, if you like. I mean, we're, we're in the third year uh, since the, the Me Too uh, phenomenon, and um, there have been some huge achievements, some setbacks, quite a lot of backlash. Um, what, what, how would you kind of audit it right now and what needs to be done and what's the next phase? I'd give it maybe a B plus. I think it opened up um, an enormous conversation, which was actually quite therapeutic for a lot of people. Uh, it, what alarmed me was the lack of investment in, sorry, that's me, um, the police coming to take me away. Um, the lack of investment in structures. And I put in the book that, you know, Chris Grayling is the great villain of Me Too, you know, for, scrap, for putting those upfront tribunal fees in which the Supreme Court later ruled were unlawful. Like there were people, you know, people got, who paid them got refunded, but there were people who just simply didn't bring a sex discrimination case or an employment harassment case um, because of them. And that's what really annoys me is that, you know, people I know who have been through sex harassment allegations, um, I think of Kate Maltby, who, who um, spoke about Damien Green, you know, making clear all the way through that she wasn't, a, it wasn't an accusation of rape. It was an accusation of, or however you want to frame it, minor harassment. But nonetheless, you know, it should be on someone's record. There should be a process where you deal with that. And the bit that gets to me about the way that we've ended up in this all or nothing, you know, is someone Satan or, are, or is it all fine? Well, no, actually, there might be a middle stage where people need to be censured by their employer. They need to be retrained. You know, they might need to be suspended for a period of time. And, and actually, because we're missing all of those levels of punishment and then crucially rehabilitation, actually the stakes feel incredibly high and somebody has to be, you know, if they can't be convicted utterly of the worst crime imaginable, then we, you know, we don't want to ruin their lives. So they have to be held up as being innocent. And actually we should, you know, if we had structures that allowed for more, um, you know, more kind of proportionate responses, I think we'd be in a lot better place. But equally, I think that the conviction of Harvey Weinstein was important because if somebody had that many accusations against them, that many telling details that were exactly the same, uh, you know, that much power in an industry and, uh, you know, and you couldn't get a conviction on that, I think there would have been, uh, you know, a riot. Um, did, you expect, did you expect him to be convicted? Alan? No, I didn't, no. I, I, I really couldn't have, because, and the thing that really cheered me about that was there was an understanding of exactly the fact that the accusers were difficult, right? That people do continue to sleep with someone who sexually harassed them or go on to a consensual relationship afterwards. And these are all, this is the education that we, we need, you know, about, about these really difficult, complex interpersonal cases. I've got called up for jury duty in 2016. And I remember thinking, God, what happens if I have to, you know, if I have to win the jury in a rape case, actually, how would I weigh that evidence? And, uh, you know, and, and I thought, well, this is awful. I've been writing about this subject for years now, and I don't feel entirely equipped to pick my way through that. How on earth is, you know, 
the average person on the street supposed to do that? And, and actually to get the lessons about what a, what a victim does and the way that you know, victims don't behave in this, this way that we kind of expect them to. Um, and I, you know, that stuff I find very, very concerning. And, and also because there's such a, it's so hard to talk about it without it being misrepresented as you want to let bad men off uh, and let them get away with it. And that's not what I want at all. But what I want, as in all sectors of justice, is for a system of proportionate punishment and the idea at some point that actually you've served your time. Because I think in the same way that, you know, putting labels on people is, is very hard if you, what, if you want to do is change their behaviour, then actually if someone is forever fallen, then almost no one is going to convict them um, or, or, you know, or, or want to believe that about them. Do you think that uh, women feel more able to come forward than they did three years ago? Or do we delude ourselves about that? I, I mean, I also had, a, and I'm sure many of the women watching this will have had, maybe some of the men will have had this thought again. If a friend came to you and said that they'd been raped and the circumstances were not cut and dried, you know, they were not a nun who was walking home and was leapt on from the bushes with three CCTV cameras and two sworn witnesses. You know, if it was one of those more difficult cases, could I at all honesty say that they should report it? And it's, it's so tough because the rate of attrition is so high on cases. You know, the, the demand for uh, all your phone records is so intrusive. Uh, you know, and then there's the domestic violence bill that's going through the Commons at the moment is trying to remove this so-called rough sex defence from murders. You know, we've had this spate of murder cases where, you know, someone has been strangled to death and the defence has been, oh, but she wanted to be strangled to death. And you think, you know, where have we, where have we got to in all this? Uh, and so I'm, I think, I mean, I think things have got better since Anita Hill because things have happened, but ultimately Brett Kavanaugh was confirmed, you know, uh, yeah. you know, actually the, the, the outcomes aren't really changing, even if the awareness is. Which I suppose speaks again to your structures point, uh, which seems to me a, a very, very good way to wind up uh, what's been, a, at least for me, an absolutely um, enthralling thinking. Um, and, and thank you all very much for coming. And I can only commend the book to you if you haven't uh, read it yet, buy it, read it, it's fantastic. Um, our next uh, meeting of the book club is on the 14th of May. Uh, I think we'll be um, chairing and it's uh, gonna be a really good one. Stuart McConey uh, talking about the nanny state and me. So please uh, do come uh, to that. Um, if you are uh, a fan of Tortoise already, you'll know about our sense maker which is our daily guide to what's going on, what's really underpinning the news. Do please, if you haven't already, sign up for that. It's, uh, it's really helping me understand this extraordinary time we're living in. Um, thank you for coming again. And please, uh, although we can't clap this, not being in the same physical space, can we thank um, Helen for her time and her wisdom with a, with a nice wave and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank all. you. Thank, thank you. you.